Uh, yeah, so I will hand over to Sean uh, for his talk. Thanks very much. Thank you, Natasha. And before I start, can I just say thank you to London Classicists of Colour for uh, having me here to talk about my research. Thank you to Mai for all of her hard work in making this talk happen, the behind the scenes kind of stuff. And thank you for everyone who's tuning in for giving up a portion of your Friday evening to hear me talk about Iran. So I've got quite a lot I'd like to go through, so I'm going to jump right in. When I started my Iranian studies master's degree in 2015, I was asked to do a little thought experiment, which I've repeated while doing my PhD with various groups of British students. I got them to write down two headings, Iran and Persia, and then to just basically write down what their first impressions were to these terms, because I wanted to see what stereotypes are associated with them. How do they cross over? Do they cross over? In the Iran column, you tend to find things like stern ayatollahs, uh, fanatically chanting crowds, you know, death to the West, America, Britain, Israel, etc. Um, you see public executions, women are all veiled and have no personality or agency of their own, which is obviously completely ridiculous. Um, in the Persia column, meanwhile, we find often some kind of predictable terms, Persian cat, carpets, Persian food, but also some more intangible items, decadence, luxury, oriental, the harem, aspects of fantasy. And that really made me kind of, um, kind of question what, what stereotypes are current in British society about Iran, about Persia. They're the same entity by different names, but you know how much awareness of this is there? And when we're looking at this entity, this Iran, this Persia, the stereotypes go back an incredibly far distance into the past. So I'm just going to share my screen and get some slides going. Let's see. everyone can see that. So the stereotyping of Iran begins almost 2,500 years ago with the Achaemenid Empire, which has often been referred to as the world's first superpower. It was the largest land empire of its time. And yet for such a large and powerful entity, it's historical reception has been defined largely by its interaction with this obscure little corner of it here in the West, its conflict with the Greek city-states. Now for the Persians, this conflict was a border war. It didn't define the empire and rebellions in Egypt and Mesopotamia were far more detrimental to its overall cohesion. But for the Greeks, for Greek identity, this was key, this confrontation and indeed victory against this larger power crystallized into the cornerstone of Greek self-identity. These views crystallized over the following centuries. They influenced the Roman Empire as it absorbed Greek textual culture. And I think in this conflict are the roots of a number of binaries which we still have in our thinking about the Middle East Many would argue this is the first confrontation between West and East, between Europe and Asia, between the civilized and the barbarian, liberty, freedom, despotism, slavery, maybe even so far as good and evil. You know, the hyperbole of these terms and the effect which these binaries have on our perceptions cannot be overstated as much now as then. So my initial research aim in my thesis was to identify whether these texts, though they're heterogeneous in terms of style, in terms of genre, and they're produced over a span of about a thousand years by Greek authors, by Greek authors writing under the Roman Empire, and by Roman authors, whether these texts adhere to a common set of stereotypes of the Persians. I believe that they do. So the most prominent stereotype relates to Persian kingship. Much of the Persians is defined by their monarchy, 
which the Greeks see as absolute, as tyrannical. They have this misconception that the Persians see their kings as gods, a bit like the pharaohs, which is not accurate. It's much more like a medieval monarchy where God appointed the king to rule on earth, but the Greeks have their own ideas on that. They see the Achaemenid king as the master of all his people and everyone else from the lowest peasant up to his courtiers and his aristocrats, and even his family members are but slaves to him. And additionally, they characterize his rule as arbitrary, that the king's whim becomes reality, no matter how spurious. So though the Achaemenid Empire, it's not a generally well-known entity in the West, in Britain, in the modern world, the names of some of its kings have filtered into the public consciousness. Cyrus, Darius, Xerxes, although I would say that they are not known in the West, primarily through images such as these of stateliness and elegance, but rather through images such as these. This fantasy Xerxes from the film 300. Yet, I believe that these images are perfect for discussing the other tropes which I identified because they encapsulate all of them. This film has reproduced the Orientalist tropes of the ancient Greeks and Romans. The other tropes which I identified were a Persian preoccupation with cruelty and violence. So numerous ancient authors describe horrific tortures and executions at length. And having had to read all of them, they're truly stomach turning in points. There's a perception that the Persians are obsessed with wealth, that they're greedy. The amount of gold in these images speaks to that, but equally that they indulge in food the king's royal banquets are often remarked upon to the extent of the dishes, the number of sauces provided. This all to the, um, to the more frugal minded Greeks, or at least that's how they like to portray themselves is, is sort of, um, is a faux pas. The Persians are characterized as cowardly, which, you know, for a military victor to condemn their defeated foe as cowardly is all too easy. But I think this also speaks to differing modes of warfare in the ancient world. The Greeks generally tended to fight in armored infantry formations, you know, two sides crash into each other until one overpowers the other. Whereas the Persians, drawing on their Central Asian uh, heritage, they prefer mounted combat. They use bows, they use javelins, they use light armor, and they use much more fluid tactics of motion than the Greeks do, which the Greeks, since they can't necessarily always counter them so easily, they like to say this is cowardly warfare. You're not doing it right, basically. The Persians are characterized as dishonest, as lying. Amongst themselves, they're shown as scheming in the sources, plotting and counterplotting, planning palace coups, but also outwardly in their dealings with the Greeks, they're seen as being underhand, promising one thing, and using spies and bribery to subvert it, essentially using indirect methods. The final set of tropes uh, relates to the Greco-Roman perception of the Persians as breaking norms of gender and sexuality. And this, uh, this is seen through, through three key points. Persian men, are characterized by the Greek sources as being effeminate. Now, this may in part stem from aesthetics. Like many other ancient Near Eastern peoples, the Persians, Persian men, used makeup. They used wigs, they used false beards. And most scandalously for the Greeks, they wore trousers, which for, Greek, uh, for a Greek audience is the, the height of uh, ridiculousness and is associated as well with the Amazons of Central Asia, the women warriors who were based on the Scythians who also wore trousers. So barbaric trousers is something definitely to bear in mind. But equally sexual norms play into this as well. So the Greeks and to some extent the Romans tolerated these sort of uh, pederastic relationships between adult men and male youths. Whereas what evidence we do have shows that Persian adult men had relationships with each other as equals 
which to the Greeks, again, was considered unacceptable in their framing of masculinity. On the flip side of these supposedly effeminate Persian men, we have the Persian women, who all of the Greek and Roman writers agree have far too much power and influence. We see this in descriptions of the Achaemenid harem, where the queens, the princesses, the queen mother, the concubines are all constantly trying to exert their influence over the reigning king to get their own son on the throne after him. And they're also blamed because they, these women are often in charge of the education of the Achaemenid princes. They are blamed for feminizing Persian men in the sources. The final point which plays into this trope is the presence of eunuchs within the Achaemenid court and its bureaucracy. So these are these people are a constant source of anxiety for the Greeks because they don't fit into a typical gender binary and the stereotypes attaching to them is that they are unscrupulous and trustworthy. They are constantly manipulating things behind the scenes. So taken all together, uh, Persian gender and sexual norms are considered entirely atypical to those of Greece and Rome. So to move away now from the ancient period, we have this rift of knowledge of comprehension. With the fall of Rome, the medieval period, Persia becomes a land of myth in large part for much of Europe. It's remembered only vaguely through biblical references to Cyrus or Ahasuerus. Fragments of the classics suffuse the culture, but it's hardly what we would call history, and they're often disseminated in more culturally accessible uh, methods, such as mystery plays focusing on Mark Antony or Julius Caesar, for example. The Renaissance, however, brings Persia back into sharper focus. The rediscovery of the Greco-Roman texts, which ironically had in large part been preserved by Arab and Persian scholars when the Christian church banned them, sets the foundation of emerging education systems in Europe as the classics. They become the foundation of the school system, in this country, the public school system. And their weight is felt well into the 20th century and certainly even today. Just as Persia is coming back on the radar, the Safavid Empire comes to power. We can see in this map, it sort of, it occupies much of um, the heartland of the old Achaemenid Empire, and we can also see it starting to resemble more the borders of the modern Iranian state as well. This Safavid Empire becomes a tantalizing goal for European delegations. They're searching for lucrative Silk Road connections, for trade, but also for a potential ally against the other Middle Eastern superpower at this point, the Ottoman Empire, with which a number of European states are in conflict, and which the Safavids are also in conflict with through much of their history. Now, the English are relative latecomers in this uh, attempt to, to reach Safavid Persia and make uh, diplomatic contacts. The first person to successfully, to some extent, do so is the merchant Anthony Jenkinson, who in 1561 arrives at the court of the Safavid Shah Tahmasp, bearing a letter from Elizabeth I. What's really striking about this letter is it's not written to a Safavid Shah it's not even written to an Islamic ruler or a medieval ruler. It's written to an ancient Persian king because this is the context that they have in England at this point. So I'd like to just read um, the introduction to this letter. It's addressed to the right mighty and right victorious prince, the great Sophie, this is the one concession to you know, contemporary history, Sophie, Safi, Safavid, they've garbled it somewhat. Emperor of the Persians, Medes, Parthians, Hyrcanes, Carmanians, Margians, of the people on this side and beyond the river Tigris, and of all men and nations between the Caspian Sea and the Gulf of Persia. Needless to say, this is in large part a failure. 
firstly, Tomas identifies Jenkinson as a Christian and has very little interest in forming an alliance with some obscure and dreary island halfway around the world when he considers himself the most powerful ruler on earth at the time. Many of these terms, Medes, hurricanes, etc., these are archaic Greek geographic terms, would have been completely unknown to the Safavid era Persians. And this rift in comprehension is solidified by the fact that these letters were written in Latin, in Italian, and in Hebrew, none of which Tamas or any of his courtiers could read. So this initial effort is well, certainly a failure. Jenkinson's own writings on Persia also kind of hint at the beginning of something which will become more influential in later accounts, which is a decline narrative. So as he travels in Persia, he makes sense of things by tying them to the classical past. You know, this heap of rocks was once the fortress of Alexander the Great, or, you know, this cave was where, I don't know, Cyrus hid as a child. Um, and seeing the contemporary Safavid Persia, it causes disappointment. It's a decline. And so I call this the decline narrative. And you see it at various stages in Persian Iranian history that at whichever point it's taken, things were always more glorious in the past and have always decayed to the present. The Safavid empire also never truly becomes a high priority for the emerging British empire. In the 17th and early 18th century, its wealth is declining. The overland Silk Road is declining as seafaring becomes more advanced and more lucrative. However, this changes in the 19th century, not for economic reasons, but for strategic reasons. From the very end of the 18th century, Iran was now ruled by the Qajar dynasty. And this is exactly the period when it becomes crucial to the British Empire. Imperial Russia had been expanding into Central Asia, was seen as a threat to British India. So Britain sought to maintain Afghanistan, this unnamed orange blob in the middle here, and Iran as buffer states. This confrontation of empires is known as the Great Game. It was a Cold War-esque conflict waged with spies, with proxies, with occasional military interventions, which included two small-scale invasions of Iran in the manner of so-called gunboat diplomacy. I'd like to talk a little bit as well about imperial anxiety and two events in particular, which I think are relevant to the reception of Iran. First and foremost, this is the first Anglo-Afghan war. So in 1839, Britain invades Afghanistan for the first and clearly not last time to depose its ruler, Emir Dost Mohammed, who is viewed as being too pro-Russian and installing his place a client king who will be sympathetic to British interests, a man named Shah Shuja Durrani. Shah Shuja proves incredibly unpopular, mainly because he wants to be an absolute ruler without consent, whereas the previous ruler had uh, governed more like the leader of a tribal confederation, so with advisors, with uh, some degree of agreement among his people and the other leaders. So the unpopularity of their client, coupled with reckless and sometimes offensive behavior by British officers and agents in Afghanistan, and crucially, the lack of a clear strategy, especially an exit strategy, leads to disaster. The British are expelled from Kabul, and their entire army is destroyed, killed by Afghan tribesmen or the harsh conditions that they flee into. This is undoubtedly one of the greatest military disasters in British history, and in it lie the roots of another. Unlike in this propaganda painting we can see here with all of these uh, heroic um, and crucially white British soldiers, the vast majority of the British army which invaded Afghanistan was made up of Indian troops, both Hindu and Muslim, who, as they fled, were abandoned by their British officers and left to freeze, starve, be enslaved, or cut down by Afghan bullets. This defeat 
This cataclysmic defeat shatters the myth of British invincibility in India. And the resentment which stems from it among the East India Company army explodes just over 10 years later in the Indian uprising of 1857, which seeks to drive the British out of India. Though this uprising is brutally crushed a year later and British control re-established, this, along with the First Anglo-Afghan War, constitute a watershed in British attitudes to the native other in Asia. Stricter lines of segregation in India are drawn. You know, the British retreat to their clubs, their bungalows, their hilltop mansions. Racist attitudes intensify. And this also affects perceptions of and writing on Iran. So this map here shows the extents of Qajar Iran, in large part within its modern borders, although we can see in the top left, it loses territory to Tsarist Russia. And in the south and the southeast, it falls under the sphere of British influence, particularly as the British control access to the Persian Gulf in what they dub the Pax Britannica, showing to what extent they see themselves as the inheritors of Roman power. The strategic importance of Iran is also what encourages a greater number of British travelers to traverse the country than ever before. These include spies, soldiers, politicians, academics, doctors, and those simply seeking adventure in a land which is only slowly being unshrouded from Orientalist fantasy in Western perception. These travelers produce a huge amount of travelogue literature. Virtually everyone writes a book and many of them are terrible writers, which makes analyzing this uh, particularly fraught. Um, in these books, they attempt to classify the nature of the land and its people. And when this becomes difficult, when they, they don't know what to make of it, they fall back upon classical stereotype, classical reference, when their contemporary knowledge, or crucially their language skills, fail them. This applies particularly to views of Nasser al-Din Shah Qajar, whose reign dominated the second half of the 19th century in Iran. Whether the travelogue writers approved of him as a powerful, strong man, an absolute ruler in the mold of the Achaemenid kings, or despised him for his cruelty, his greed, his failure to enact reforms, and his... Uh, what they characterize as a childish obsession with the various mechanical toys he was gifted by European delegations, he is invariably the focus of British writing on Iran in this period, including in the travelogues, even if they don't actually meet the Shah. Much of the rest of the population, meanwhile, are reduced to faceless, nameless drones, whose only desire is either to serve the throne or cower away from it and flee. Courted by the British and the Russians, <clears throat> pardon me, um, Nasser al-Din is courted by the British and the Russians, both. They're both trying to exert their influence on him to extend their influence within Iran. And they seek to control aspects of the Iranian economy and infrastructure in order to achieve this, while giving the Shah increasingly extortionate loans. However, by playing them off against each other, he nonetheless manages to maintain a large degree of Iran's independence in this period, which is relatively unique when you have two imperial powers fighting over you. So I would argue that Iran was to a large degree colonized, but it was economically colonized rather than territorially colonized. The travelogues are also very preoccupied along with the monarchy with the aesthetics of Iran, with the art, and with fantastical uh, versions of Iran, which in large part never truly existed. The harem is a key example of this. So these paintings demonstrate the Orientalist expectation of the harem, a sphere to explore sexuality, sensuality, decadence, and the staging for any number of uh, novels and plays and operas. The problem with this is that 
when your expectation is rooted almost entirely in fantasy, reality becomes disappointing. Here we have the harem of Nasser al-Din Shah Qajar. And though Nasser al-Din certainly had concubines, the harem never truly was about sexual indulgence. Its priority was always the guarding of the royal household and the security of the royal bloodline, deciding who would sit on the throne next and who was legitimate and who was not. So these people are the Shah's mother, his sisters, his wives, his concubines, his children. However, this elicits uh, from the travelogue writers some very damning uh, verdicts on Persian women. For example, Isabella Bird, of the writers I looked at, the only woman, uh, criticized the slovenliness, slipshodness, and generally tumbling to pieces look of the average Persian woman while gushing about the radiant visions of uh, European missionaries that she occasionally came across in the country. I think the biggest problem with using stereotype as a guide to any country or any people is that it obscures change, the capacity for change. In 1891, George Nathaniel Curzon, who would later become a very unpopular viceroy of India in the early 20th century, wrote of Iran that there is not a single man in the kingdom who dare venture either his voice or his position against the sovereign. And in that same year, we have these scenes, the tobacco protests. Now, this began when British were granted a monopoly over the growth, the sale, and the export of tobacco from Iran. Now, after tea, I think tobacco is probably the most highly consumed uh, commodity in Iran, certainly in this period. And this causes absolute outrage. So much of the economy has already been sold off to the British and this is just a step too far for many people. A wave of protest sweeps the country. There is a fatwa in 1891 by Ayatollah Shirazi, a nationwide boycott, which even includes members of Nasser ad-Din's own harem. They give up their water pipes, they stop buying tobacco. And what's even more striking is that it works. In 1892, the monopoly is canceled. This is not enough to save Nasser al-Din, who four years later is assassinated. So despite the clear ability of the Iranian population to mobilize in opposition to an increasingly unpopular monarchy, British commentators fail to really appreciate this. They see this as a blip, particularly because it involves their own economic interests. They think that this has been cooked up by Russia or cooked up by Islamic fanatics, that this is a, a bump in the road of what is otherwise an unchanging landscape in Iran, politically at least. This leads them to completely fail to anticipate the constitutional revolution, which breaks out in 1905, which relegates Muzaffar ad-Din Shah, the son of Nasser ad-Din, to the status of a figurehead monarch, though his successor does manage to claw back power from the newly established Majlis, the parliament. He manipulates differences between the secular liberals and the religious factions within the constitutional movement. This revolution nonetheless demolishes the idea of the unwillingness of the Iranian people to influence their own political system and to decide what kind of country theirs will be. And yet, British foreign policy does not change. Britain continues to view the support of a strong man ruler as the only option for stability in Iran, as the only option for furthering their interest in Iran. Certainly not unique in British foreign policy, neither then or today, but in this instance, it is underpinned by belief in the eternal nature of Persian monarchy and the inherent subservience of its people to that monarchy. You cannot have one without the other. The British back a coup by this man, Reza Khan, encouraging him 
not only to take power, but to take the throne rather than the office of president, which he originally aimed to have. His reign brings in a period of rapid modernization and industrialization, but also coupled with a refocusing on Iran's ancient past, its pre-Islamic past, which is an anathema to much of the Islamic conservative population. And perhaps unwittingly plays into expectations of Western writers. You know, he orders the name of the country to be changed from Persia to Iran in 1935 to get away from these associations with decadence, with the Oriental. And yet he's privileging a kind of history which the vast majority of the people in his own land are not aware of and do not have access to be aware of. So it's it's kind of, um, it's a bit in two directions really there. And again, the problem with having a strong man ruler in place is that he can change his mind on a whim. So as the 30s progress, Reza Khan, Reza Shah grows closer to Germany. He's trying to get out from underneath British influence, which leads in 1943, to a joint British-Soviet invasion of Iran. Not many people know that Britain has invaded Iran in the 20th century, but yes, here we are. Winston Churchill meeting the new Shah, Mohammad Reza, the son of Reza Shah. A Swiss-educated playboy is now expected by the British to be their strongman client in Iran. Sorry. In the years following the Second World War, British oil revenues from Iran constituted the largest source of overseas income. They propped up a rapidly crumbling empire and were a source of intense anxiety. This was overseen by the Anglo-Iranian oil company, known today as British Petroleum, BP. Attempts to nationalize the oil on the part of the Iranians to gain a more equitable share of the vast profits that were being extracted from their soil, led to the overthrow of Iran's only democratically elected leader, Mohammad Mossadegh, in a British US coup in 1953. The post-coup reign of Mohammad Reza Shah doubles down on his father's emphasis on the pre-Islamic past, spending lavish sums on the celebration of 2,500 years of Persian monarchy at Persepolis, while much of the population continues to live in poverty. He absolutely buys into this image of Iran as eternal and unchanging. He dresses his army as ancient Persian soldiers. He salutes the tomb of Cyrus. He has gone fully for this man. His increasingly unpopular and disconnected regime is underpinned by the fourth highest military budget in the world at this time, which is used primarily to buy British and American military hardware. While the populace who may oppose him are terrorized, tortured and imprisoned by the brutal Savak secret police trained by the CIA and by the MI6. In 1977, in December, Anthony Parsons, the British ambassador to Iran, sends his annual review to London, in which he warns, though certainly understates, the levels of discontent with the Shah. He highlights the signs of growing dissent on the streets, and he criticizes the disconnect of the ruler from his people. And the response that he receives is truly remarkable. He receives a letter back the following February, so it takes two months, from M.S. Weir at the Foreign Office, who describes the people, describes the Iranians as the epitome of idleness, deceitfulness, corruption, charm, and conceit, and thereby writes off any prospect of Mohammad Reza Shah being overthrown or the end of the monarchy in Iran. And yet, less than two years later, Shah Raf, the Shah is gone. Having studied this topic now for four going on five years, having read ancient texts, having read Victorian travelogues, having read modern travelogues, 
it's hard not to believe that stereotyping lies somewhere in human nature. The instinct to simplify, to caricature the other, to make something understandable and to break it down. Equally, I believe this is something which can be corrected through study, through exposure, through an open mind, through a willingness to engage with otherness and not fear it, to see it as something positive and interesting. However, what my research has also reinforced is that when stereotypes become integral to knowledge production, to education, to our histories, to our politics and to our culture, it blinds us to what is before our eyes. So thank you very much. I'm looking forward to hearing your questions and your comments. <laughs>